hopefully you enjoyed the booze and the awesome pizza. Um, we'll be introducing Patrick in just a few minutes, but I wanted to just give you some background. Patrick is one of the mentors in our program for the Games Academy at Ohio, so basically that's an accelerator for mobile game developers who want to create blockbuster social games. If you're interested, there's a flyer in some of these packets, and I encourage you, if you're sort of like sitting around in the back, to come take a seat up front. And with that, I'll keep it short and sweet. Let me introduce Patrick. He'll uh, give you a little bit about his background information. Hi, everybody. Patrick Chun. Um, just a quick background on me. Uh, I used to work at a law firm called Business Ancini. That's a big tech law firm in Palo Alto. I was there in 1997, right part of the first dot-com bubble. And um, I did what a lot of lawyers did, which is I left the law three years later and jumped into my own bubble. And uh, we raised that startup $66 million doing pre-Skype voice for IP. We hit 14 million users in 2001, right and high, and then blew it all. So saw the rise, saw the fall. And uh, after busting it out on a, in a startup, went back to law and eventually ended up joining SK Telecom Ventures. Just a quick plug on us. Uh, we are the venture arm for SK Telecom, which is the largest wireless carrier in Korea. But our telecom company owns actually interesting assets like Cyworld, which is the largest social network in Korea. We still, uh, although Facebook is coming out strong, we're still bigger than they are, and we still have uh, better engagement numbers. But they are formidable, so we consider them we also own the largest music label in Korea, which is called uh, Loen. We also own the Spotify and Pandora. So we actually distribute uh, more music, uh, legal music, than anyone. So we've got a lot of media properties, mobile properties, and internet properties. And our job at the fund, which we started, which I founded in 2008, is to help bring some of the best and brightest to Korea. And if SK ever wants to leave Korea and work outside of Korea, to have those partnerships uh, ready and work. So, so my plug, just to kind of keep it back in your mind, we love games. We actually are the a top five Android marketplace in the world. We basically, most of that is games. So if you have a game, you want to bring it to Korea, we can help. So um, that being said, I'm going to jump into this stuff. Wallet Wilson's on CD. Oh, please. Do you mind if I ask a quick question? Sure. Um, so you mentioned something here about social gaming and, and, and or uh, I'm sorry, social, social networking platforms in general around the world. I'm just kind of curious about your take on on uh, the relative successes of um, you know. I mean, we've seen things like even Google's Orchid having you know like massive success in Brazil but nowhere else and, and stuff like that. And I, I guess I was just kind of curious. What's your guys' take as far as uh, are you trying to is it, do you think the new thing is is build wide? try to build something as a platform for the whole world, or do you think it's built global? Uh, and I, I guess I really just ask that because, um, I mean, I don't know about anyone else, but I'd say maybe 95% of my friends are in the US, right? And then probably those are the most relevant things to me on a day-to-day -day basis. And I would assume it's the same for Korea. Um, is that, is, is kind of the focus been, let's try to build a platform to conquer the world, or is it has it been, let's, let's build a platform to conquer South Korea and show Google they don't know what, they don't know what the hell Korea wants. Because, let's face it, I've watched Korean TV. I don't understand Korea at all. You guys have StarCraft tournaments. I mean, right. So, right. so for, for Cyworld, we actually have 90% of the population between the ages of 13 and 40. Mm -hmm. So we can't really grow anymore. And the question is, what do we do with Cyworld, right? So first is, I'd like to defend Korea against Facebook. It's sort of ideal, but I'm not sure if that will happen. Um, and as we look outside of Korea, the, the angle that I'm recommending to SK Telecom is think vertically, think more narrowly. Don't, don't think you can go ahead and get against Facebook. That's just not going to happen. Maybe in five years from now, maybe there'll be another shot. Maybe they'll get so broad and, and they'll sort of lose their focus. But right now, they're, so it's they're not more. It's, it's not hard for me to see this. It's, it's, it's most people are thinking, let's spread out and try to spread our profits as international profits. For SK Telecom, yes, it's very important. Do you think? It, it, just to, just to get some perspective, do you think most companies are thinking along the same way? In Korean companies? Or, or just, just kind of in general, do you think most companies are pursuing the same strategy? It does seem that way. I'm, just, um, I'm curious. I, I would say 
if you want to do something really, really well, yeah. I think you have to be very focused. Yeah. And then I, my, my feeling is you need to have a great experience. And then if things work out, you can spread out. And then as you get more users, then you can start thinking about how to really develop something to a platform. Okay. I think the experience comes first. Trying to build a platform from the beginning is really tough. I think Papai has actually done a good job to get to the reach that they've got. I mean, so I, I've been very impressed with what they've been able to do. But it all started with great content for them, in my perspective. Sure. Sure. I, I'm not trying to derail you. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. It's a good question. Yeah. Uh, maybe it sets a context for yeah. the conversation tonight. <laughs> uh, so just so everyone knows, like when I was at Wilson Sansini, part of what I'd love to do was to advise startups. And so what you're about to see tonight, I've talked about since 1997, so it's like 14, 15 years. So, um, you know, I'm happy to plow through this really quickly, give you some highlights, or we can go, you know, if you see a slide, you want to stop on something, you raise your hand, we can just jump into it. But I'll, I'll try to break it out so that we save some room. So at the end, is when I talk about it, more like financing related things, like how do you raise money? But in the beginning, it's more like internally to you, like how do you build a company, how do you have at least a formal structure for a company, what does all that mean? So, um, let's maybe go to the first slide. So, I've got the same thing right here, by the way. Um, I guess, how many of you guys are, have a day job and not, in basically not committed 100% to your startup? All right, so, you know. Are, those are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> well, it depends. So, it, it depends on the, on the employer. So if you want to be very strict about it, right, an employer, if you're using company time and company equipment for your idea, guess who owns it? Not you. The company owns it. Now, you can try to sneak out. But if any investor calls and if they do their due diligence, they're going to say, wait, wait a minute. They, they just look and go, wait, you know, how long have you been working on this? How long have you been working on your company? Let me just call them up and see if they're cool. And if you've got an employer that says, no, 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 I'm Zynga. That was my game. I guess you're not going to own it. So I think you guys just need to be very careful about, yeah, go ahead. So I'm actually in the opposite situation where I've been working on my own startup and come to the conclusion that for personal and professional reasons, I'd like to get a full-time job for a while, mm -hmm. but I don't want the dream to die and I don't want the new company to own it. I'm very sort of you know, clear about that. And in an ideal world, I'd love to be able to work on it a little bit while I have that job, but that maybe that's asking too much. But at least I want to not lose what I've promised I've made so far. So there are a couple ways to um, solve it. Right? So the first way to solve it is, you know, work nights and weekends on it on your own machine. Don't even answer email from work, even on a Gmail account, or whatever. Right. Um, so that's sort of the practical way. Um, another way to do it is to just disclose up front to your employer. Say, look. Um, you know, I, I'm going to commit myself full time, but there's this other thing I'm working on, and we might have, um, you know, I might have to do something going, and just just be aware of it, right? So the disclosure part can save you as well. So they know that this is yours and this is a blonde to the company. And usually, what what it is, especially if you have some IP, uh, you when you sign a, uh, is it here? When you sign the uh, invention assignment agreement. There's, there's an exclusion part, and then usually on the last page, just write out what you've been doing and what you own. It's like, this is a book belongs to the company, it belongs to me. So that kind of IP, because just in case there's any overlap, you can be very clear that your inventions, your, uh, yeah, your inventions are yours. So that's to kind of help uh, clear that up. Um, I think the, this assumes the opposite situation, like you said. This assumes that you know you have um, you are in a company and you're trying to leave a company. The the things the mistakes that we see as venture capitalists and the things that um, really you know bother me as also as a lawyer, right, is that once you leave, you go, well, who do I know? Who I need help? Who who who, who do I trust? Who do I know? These are people that generally you've worked with in the past. Be careful not to violate the non solicit clause that you're going to sign. I don't know any company in California that's ever announced this clause. That's a really good way to, to piss off people that you shouldn't be pissing off, you know. So, um, all, you know, basically the, the point of this slide is just do unto others as you like to do unto you because when you have employees and they leave, it's not cool if suddenly 
one really smart engineer walks out the door and takes the staff with him. So it, it is a, um, just think of it that way and stay out of trouble. Give me a good next slide. Unless anyone has questions. Um, there, was, there was one thing on the previous slide I had oh. thought about. The, um, so um, the, um, as far as, you know, the, just, just in your experience as a venture capitalist, the, the, um, is most of what you see that, that, um, in, my, that, that in like the longer term the companies want, uh, uh, is that this is more of a problem for the successful startups than the non-successful ones, right? That they, I mean, that's really only becomes a problem, gets into a headache problem when these, uh, when these startups start seeing major revenue and the, the other company wants a piece of it. It, it becomes a problem during due diligence. So if you have investors who are not just smart, they're, they're, they have fiduciary duties yeah. to their investors to make sure that when they... So they see five guys coming from one company, they see them that they've, been, uh, they've obviously got code they've been working on for six months. They start thinking, okay, what, what, am, what are we getting ourselves into? That's, that's, that's the, what you're basically saying. Right, and uh, you know, we see situations where publicly traded companies who are known for suing former employees yeah. have come to us saying, we built this. And we're like, gee, this looks awfully good to something that they would love to have. Why wouldn't they want this? And they're like, no, 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 the, the CTO is our advisor. You can call him, and he'll, he'll sign whatever he needs to sign to clear this. So Does it help if it's in like a, they're kind of a separate space, like obviously not competing with the, with the product line of the company working on? Yes, as long as you're OK with your investor calling your former employer and saying, hey, we think this is not non-competitive, we don't think you need this, what do you think? And sometimes the investors will say, by the way, we need a piece of paper saying they will basically disavow any rights to any of that technology. Sure. Okay. So it really depends, but that question will come up faster than you think. Because so, this, so, so this is why you're saying basically that uh, involve legal early. Because because th this kind of stuff is going to get in your way faster than you Yeah, it's, you know. By the way, I, I, as a former lawyer, I really would uh, not encourage you. I mean, you, you should talk to a lawyer, <laughs> but I don't. I wouldn't rush to a lawyer immediately. I would just say this kind of stuff so, will keep you out. Of, should keep you out of trouble. So I actually know your former boss, Judy O'Brien. I know Judy O'Brien. You know Judy O'Brien. Yeah, yeah, she's great. She's she's a very good friend of mine. Okay. So she's uh, she's not really doing this level of startup anymore, but she's been giving me, feeding me names on a weekly basis of people I should talk to. Cool. They want to do pro bono stuff. But, but you're, you're actually suggesting don't, don't get involved with a lawyer at this stage? You don't have to. You know, I mean, I'm just saying, if, if you're just inside of a company, and you're not ready to, and we'll go through this, yeah. if you're not ready to make that jump, it's, it's probably too early. Oh, by the way, I hope I'm not derailing your conversation. Yeah. I'm not. I, if I if I am, please just tell me to shut up. I don't know. 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 I don't Okay, should we go to the next one? Uh, yeah. Is everything that you're saying now applicable across all the states or specifically California? Because I know California has good uh, uh, not compete clause protection and stuff like that that they speak to the way. Uh, but is everything applicable across the board? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm California trained and California bar member, so this is really just from California. Um, I would say other states can be more restrictive to the employee, like you mentioned. So I would imagine that. If you're outside of the the California jurisdiction, you might have more pain. Yeah, specifically, so incorporated in California means that these are outside. No, no. Uh, actually, incorporation doesn't matter. It's where you're physically located. So um, we'll get to it later. But my recommendation is go Delaware. Delaware is much much easier. Um, so so basically, in here is is talking about when do I need to incorporate a company, and essentially. Our advice, my advice has historically been, if you've got more than one person, and this person is someone you've sort of met, you know, you, you know well, but it's um, it's kind of choppy. You're not sure exactly how long you guys are going to be together. You know, you like each other, but one person is working kind of not really. You, you know, then having a framework for your relationship is actually pretty helpful. It's good to. 
have rules in place. And what I mean by rules, I mean, first of all, like, who's the CEO? Who's in charge? You know, you can't, you could have co-CEOs, but that's generally something we don't recommend. You want someone to say, we defer this person. You can always elect a new CEO. I mean, it's your rules. But what's more important, actually, is ownership. Because what we've seen time and time again, our blood brothers, we're in this for life, working hard, and all of a sudden, one guy drops out. And, and then the next person picks it up and runs with it. And then as investors are doing diligence, they go, wait a minute, um, wasn't Kim working with Joe on this? We've heard this woman Kim's name a lot. She was around a lot, right? And, it's like, and then we go to her and go, well, what did you do? Why well, wrote the code? Okay, you did some really interesting stuff. Um, do you own half the company? You're partners, 50-50. What, what, what's the relationship there? But now she's been gone for maybe six months. Okay, now what? So those kinds of questions can be resolved very quickly because you can do, you can vest your stock, for example. So if someone isn't around for a certain period of time, um, or let's say your founder say, so you oh look, we get one year of credit, or six months of credit, they at least have walk away with something. But at least they're not walking away with half the company. Because that will get really ugly really quickly. So that's, that's principally the reason why I would uh, incorporate is because you have other people you're working with, you need to formalize who owns what. Um, the other side of it, too, is uh, with respect to working with others. So you may have, you may have to license something, you may have to uh, hire consultants, things like that. Well, when you start doing things like hiring other people, you get what's called liability, right? People could get hurt, you may miss paying your taxes, and the government hates when people don't pay taxes. They come after you. So at least with a incorporation structure, you can shield yourself from liability. That's when it starts to get serious. If you're doing everything yourself, you bought your machine, you work in your house, it's just you, don't worry about it. But as, start, as soon as your circle starts expanding, you're gonna probably need to be incorporated. So, so uh, out of the, I guess the obvious question, especially to a lawyer is, how come LLCs survive such a scale in the legal business, but not the tech business? So LLCs are fantastic, flexible vehicles for tax optimization, meaning multiple layers of tax, right? Because if you're a corporation and there's an income from the corporation and they want to pay a stockholder, not through salary, but through a dividend, the corporation pays tax first, then the shareholder pays the tax. It's double taxation, right? LLCs is passive. So you don't have to worry about it. So it's like, hey, whatever the corporation makes, it goes to the, the shareholders, or the, the like, whatever, the uh, interest rate. Treated as income. So right, so that structure works okay, but in venture capital, because every, like for the last 35, 40 years, there's been a history of common stock versus preferred stock, and, what, and there's a lot of these standard term sheets that are in place, and all the tax implications are understood. Through evolution, that's sort of been the way it is, right? Yes, you could have an LLC that would have the same sorts of benefits, but the amount of brain damage you'd have to do, and, and sort of like, who wants to be a pioneer and spend a couple hundred thousand dollars dealing with this set of documents? It's much easier just to kind of go the path that everyone else did. So that, that's really, it's, that's the answer. It's not like <coughs> LLCs are worse than C-Corps. It's just that. You can do a C, you can do a C corp and have financing documents in less than ten thousand dollars. To do that with an LLC would probably cost fifty to one hundred thousand dollars because the tax issues you have to deal with. Yeah. One of the things that I've been hung up on, which is why I haven't formed a corporation, is because I've been doing this for a while on my own and I have a bunch of crap that I guess I own. No one else own it. You know, apps and websites and stuff. And I'm kind of hung up on whether to assign that to the corporation, and if so, how, you know, legally do I just give it to the corporation once it's informed? Is that a good idea? Should I keep the old stuff for myself? I, you know, I, I, I get lost in that. Right, so, a, a good, like, so, the first thing is, you can always contribute your IP in exchange for your ownership interests. So, this is a piece of paper that says, I give all these things, you list them out, in exchange for these many shares. Now, the cool thing about Delaware Corps is that you can have a par value of 0.000001%, one cent if you want. 
right? It, it can be nothing. So, um, but in your situation, if you're concerned about liability issues, people using your things, and you never know, right? Then I would say maybe start with an LLC, right? Put everything in there, and then later on, if things start to get really serious, you can always convert the LLC to a C corp. It does add a little bit of transaction cost, but at least you have a vehicle. And then, if you're doing things, you can then talk to account about getting buy offs and stuff like that. Because it's your business. Yeah. How do you, uh, in between like uh, adding a founder and hiring somebody, is there a way to sort of structure where you bring someone in for just equity? And one way to do that, I look around, is to sort of have them sign a contract or agreement for some percentage of that also. Uh, is that common or? So it is done probably frequently. Um, but the, the Wilson Sound City advice that was, oh, I would say, hey, here's the company line, so you might as well know it, is that, again, cutting, giving equity to somebody while fine is also circumventing the tax system. So the government wants FICA, they want the social security tax, they want all that stuff. So you have to 1099 them. You know, if you're gonna follow the, you know, the law. If you don't, it just means that you're exposed and you, they can come after you. Um, so, in your situation, oh, let me tell you the other, the second company line is that the minimum wage is the minimum wage. So, they should work for minimum wage. Now, you can exchange the minimum wage for stock, but you still gotta pay the tax on the minimum wage. So, um, now, that's, that's like being airtight, you know, absolutely clean. Yeah, you could do it for other ways. You know, uh, you know, you didn't hear that from me. This is not being recorded. So you can do it for other ways, but you know, just be, just understand the risk. Okay. So if you do that, you'd have to follow 1099 and do a lot of kind of things, bring that person as a formal contractor kind of thing. That's technically how you do it. But if you, like right. I said, it's cleaner if you do a W-2 with payment and wages if you pay them. Stock. Right, right. So again, some people want to be have the the A plus. Great. Some people are like, let's just pass. Okay. Just passing is the let's just give a stock. We all shake our heads saying yes, that's fine. So then, yeah, I guess it, the benefit of the 1099 is you save you some upfront cash, I guess, or from having to pay taxes. Or something. Right. And does the the impact of that person who signs a contractor agreement, then they are essentially getting stock, and I guess they uh, the impact on them is, I guess they how they recognize their revenue or whatever for the IRS, would that be tricky for them to say? That? Right, well they'd have to, you'd have to have an evaluation of that stock. You'd have to say, hey, this is worth five cents a share. So it'd be very low, and does that cause giant alarms? I guess some of it is kind of common in startup, but not a normal tax return. I guess it isn't, does it look really bad for that person who's a contractor to recognize, you know, their five cents for the stock every, at best, let's say once a month or whatever it is? Yeah, you know, um, that's interesting. We, uh, we're actually going to address that in a little bit. So how about we, we wait for the a slide a little later? Because that's actually a very good point. But I think it'll dovetail with another okay. issue. Um, anybody else have questions on this page? Yeah, just a quick piece of question. For the founder, founder reasons, I know there's an outstanding talent or outstanding skills one, and then there's just the founder's one. But does that person have to have a majority share of the company in order to retain the visa? It's a really question, good question, and I don't know the answer. Because uh, there are immigration attorneys who you know that. But do you know the answer, Alex? Uh, yeah. Maybe we should go next page. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of give you the the 80 20 rule, right? I'm just going to tell you kind of what typically is done. There's always exceptions, and we can talk about all the wrinkles. Um, but 
everything I'm telling you is to kind of make your life easier because I think you should be focusing on your business and not worrying so much about this stuff. But these are the little things that tend to trip up everybody. So should, this is your question. Should founders pay for their stock in cash or contribute to control property? You can contribute to control property. It's fine. So I, we've seen that lots of times. I've seen companies still selling for you know, almost a billion dollars started from just a little piece of paper. Oh, I'm contributing this idea for this kind of thing. And off it goes. So you don't have to pay cash. But even if you did pay cash, you can set the price to be so low it's only hundred dollars to own hundred percent of the company and own ten million shares. It has no relationship. So, um, the next one is: Should founder stock be subject to vesting before venture financing? And my general recommendation when I was a lawyer to founders was: impose it on yourself. So you can say, "Hey, look, I started this idea in 2009, right? Or no, that's a better example: 2011, right?" In, Let's call it January. And then start the vesting clock. So you can say, you know what? I'm vesting and hey, look, um, I'm like everybody else. So when other people come on, it's like, hey, look, we're all subject to vesting. You should get it too. But more importantly, for investors, it's about negotiating, right? If you have no vesting, they have every right to say to you, well, you know what? Let's restart this all over again. Let's start vesting over from today. Because I invest in you from today. So let's start over the four-year clock and the one-year cliff, right? Do you guys know what one-year cliff is? You get no vesting unless you've been there for a year, and then after that, you get 25%. Usually every month thereafter, you get 148 until it's four years. So my recommendation was, well, just impose it upon yourself. Then when the investor comes and says, well, hey, you know, I want to revest, you're like, well, I'm already 13 months in. What do you want? Let's negotiate that. I'll split it with you if that's what you want. At least you get something out of it versus the real chance of starting with zero. So, you know, it's negotiating. Exactly. That's, that's what I'm saying, if you do it yourself, you avoid some of the negotiation issues. Um, you know, the best in terms of founder stock is, uh, this is the next question. Again, um, I think what's reasonable is what we call double trigger acceleration, which means that if you are acquired and the buyer fires you for what we call good reason. You know, they fire you not for cause and not for good reason, then you would get acceleration of the rest of your vesting. So that double trigger is pretty fair. Some people say, well, why should we do that? I should just have single trigger so that if we get acquired, I get 100% of my vesting. Well, usually the buyer is buying you because, uh, and your company because of you. They want the talent. So suddenly if you are able to walk out the door, after they've spent all this money on the company, that's usually bad for any deal price. So you're gonna suppress the value of the company. In addition, you may scare off buyers, because they don't wanna to have to negotiate with you. They like you, they wanna do the deal, but now it's like, oh, there's this issue. I like him, I don't know if I like him that much to go through this brain damage, right? It, it's a matter, so why make a, make a problem for yourself? So just volunteer for double trigger acceleration and be done with it. Again, you can do it your own way. I'm just, again, giving you sort of the 80-20 rule. And now this is what I want to talk about, about the vesting issue you were talking about. This is the, what's called the 83B election. So um, I wish I could draw this for you, so you have to use your imagination. So in the, under the standard IRS rules, kind of like what you're talking about, when you get a block of stock, and let's say, let's break it up so that, let's say it's called 25, uh, 100 shares. So 25 shares vest after year one, and each month thereafter, 148 best thereafter. No, it's okay. Then you have some like, poor drawing skills. Yeah, I was being, yeah, was, thank you. Um, but I might have to if you guys really don't can follow. So what's been happening is that after a year when your stock vests, the IRS actually says, hey, this is great. You've just vested. You just now basically earn your stock. Therefore, we get to capture some of the value and tax you on that. Now, guess what? Usually you don't have cash to do that. And you usually don't know that what is the current firm market value on the day of investing. And guess what? That's going to happen every month thereafter. Pain in the ass. So what the IRS did is they said, well, let's set up this thing called an A3B election. And effectively, if you send in this one-page piece of paper, 
within 30 days of getting your option, then they don't look at every time it vests. They just basically look at it at the time you exercise your option. And then they look at, at that point in time, let's say you bought it at a penny, and now it's worth a dollar. Now you have 99 cents of gain. Now when the gain hits you, when you exercise it, it's not on income tax, but what's called AMT, the alternative minimum tax. That's a whole different tax discussion you'll need someone much smaller than me to help you with. But let me just tell you this, if you get stock options, file the A3B immediately. Don't wait till the last day. It's a, it saves everyone tax headaches. Don't pay the IRS if you don't have to. They're giving you a way out, so you might as well take it. Question? Is that the same for if you're an LLC or a C corp? Yeah, it's usually any, any um, interest, and interest is broadly defined as any sort of right or property in which it is subject to forfeiture. So if you, uh, remember it's vesting, so if you don't stay for a year, you forfeit, right? right? So that's, that's the key thing, it has to be subject to forfeiture. So if it's an LLC interest subject to forfeiture, yes. Yeah. My general question is, what's like legally what makes a founder, what's the difference between a founder and another person? Is there a thing called founder stock? I see that term, is it more of just, uh, I mean there's common stock, preferred stock, just, Founder stock the stock that belongs to a founder? Great question. So, founder can be anybody you want it to be. I, I remember I met a company that had like 14 founders. I'm like, all right, all right, all right. Okay, who's the real founder here? Some of that person stand up. We got to talk to that guy or girl. Um, it's just, I, what I would say is founder stock is the stock that you get on the first day when it's 0. 0.000001 cent per share, when it is worth nothing and you are just starting from scratch together. Whoever gets that, to me, is founder stock. Usually those people are also getting, they're dividing, you know, if it's three people, 33%, 33%, 33%. Or maybe it's 50%, 25, 25, something, right? They're usually holding a big chunk. If once you come, even one week later, if they're employees, they're joining up and they get more than 5% of the company, or 2% of the company, depending on their role. So I look at functionally, that from that perspective, but in the working world, you can call it, you can call it founder whatever you want. That, uh, does, that make, does that make sense? Uh, yeah, that's, oh. that's my understanding. Clarifying. Okay. okay. So what, what are the downsides of inflating the valuation of the company for the purpose of issuing stock to, so let's say you have the couple of founders who are pretty happy with their equity situation, and then we, you have someone come on there and it's like, well, we, we currently value these shares at, you know, 50 cents a piece or a dollar a piece, so pretty good. So, uh, what's so the check on that? My general recommendation has been for your employees, give no be generous and keep the stock price low because you never know what's going to go. Like my company I told you about in the, in the early 2000s, I mean, at what point on paper, man, Many, many zeros. That's what I was worth, right? And then 12 months later, it was worth nothing. So, you know, the the point of the having preferred stock versus common, the common stock, those folks that receive that in formal options should be using a sweat equity to build value. And it almost doesn't matter what they get. It's the investors who you want to put the price on so they can basically pay the employees, right, to create this whatever. So that's where the valuation should come from. And I'm going to divert here for a second off of these, because this to kind of go extend on your point, which, which is when you have, when you issue stock options, it's, again, the IRS rule is you need to get what's called a 49A valuation. So in the beginning, I wouldn't set the price too high because in a way, it, you don't know, right? If you've got three people who are founders and person number four joins, you really should just give them a smaller chunk of the company, but you shouldn't inflate the value because in a way, once you get to, um, not sort of value, but once it starts to feel real, I don't know, it's not a very precise term, where they have to spend real money to buy into the company, then really what you should be doing is go out and get a 49A valuation because then you're really going to protect yourself from the IRS. Because what the 49 evaluation does is just what the IRS says. 
hey, you, you're issuing stock options. That has to be done at fair market value. Well, who determines that? The IRS says, we want, if you do it yourself, you have to prove to us why that's a fair market value. If you get a third party to do it, which costs between five and $10,000, then it's up to the IRS to refute your fair market valuation. The reason why it's important is that if you gave uh, options, and this is a little counter to what I just said, but if you gave options at lower than fair market value, then you, the company, and the employee both pay a 20% tax, excise tax on the Delta, which sucks. And it's not only that, it also goes to your liability line on your balance sheet. So it's just a bad situation. So for what was very early, I said, just give the cheap options and don't worry about it. But when you get a little bit older and a little bit more mature, you need to do 49. And so why are the options so popular to start with the grants been so popular with uh, uh, the larger organizations? I think, again, um, I, don't, I don't know if they always the right answer to this. Um, which I hope you guys will respect, so you guys go ask a lawyer who's been practicing more recently than I have. And, and my, my understanding is because with a grant and an option, you're already taking a um, employment compensation hit on your books, so you might as well just be giving them the stock. That's my understanding. But that's just a, that could just be one perspective. I, when I ask that question, that's why I'm back. But there are probably other better reasons. But in the beginning, like options just kind of make more sense in a way because now you give a big chunk of them. And, um, but I don't know. I, I still like it options. Might be worth looking into is what you're saying. Go look into it. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a good question, which I don't know the answer to. Um, the, the next slide here. Um, how many shares should you reserve under a stock option plan? In the beginning, I'd say 15%. Keep it easy. Could it be more? Sure. Could it be less? Sure. Should it be under 10? Why not? But 15% doesn't make anybody blink. If it's, if it's 5%, what your investor will do is he'll say, or he or she will say, oh, by the way, when we determine your pre-money valuation, we're going to assume you've increased your option pool to X, and they'll dictate it to you. You'll have to negotiate that. If you do 15% ahead of time and whittle down maybe to 12 or 10 or 8, it doesn't say much. But Again, if it was too low, they would say, you do the option pool ahead of time, and then we will assume on a pre-money basis that's what it came out of, so we, don't, we as investors don't get diluted. So that's kind of the, the range of, say, 15%. Um, we just discussed 498A a little bit ahead of time. Um, oh, we just, yeah, so let's go to the next page. All right, so now I'm going to get into a little bit of when you raise money, do you sell preferred stock or do you sell debt? So um, there is a sort of the soup du jour. For a while it was, hey, you know what? Let's do convertible notes because that's cheaper and quicker and you can get the same economics. And later on it's, no, we should do equity because of this. My recommendation is for you guys is just do debt. It's cheaper. Keep the lawyers out of it. It really is, um, you, can, you can get some of the same economics, that at least the investor can, uh, through, uh, through basically a structure where that you price, you can cap the round, the valuation of the company, so they at least capture more upside. Um, but I do know a lot of very powerful early stage investors who have now disavowed debt. So what they may not end up liking over time though is paying lawyers $50,000 and they can so when you're raising half a million dollars, give me 40 of that extra, that delta, to the lawyer, doesn't sound like an interesting time to me. That sounds like a bad idea. I've got a question about the, the, the debt versus equity is interesting to us. If we were actually thinking about, um, right now we've got a split equity situation, which is pretty equal, and we'd like to keep it that way. But what does that mean again, split equity? The split, the, the, the third or third of equity. Oh, okay, got it. Third or third of third equity. But one of the things we consider, we want to consider, we want to hold off uh, our any kind of outside Series A and make it internal. But um, one of us has more capability to have an infusion, and it, debt seems like a pretty good uh, way to do that. Kind of thing. 
Is that is that normal? Is that like a normal a good path for that kind of thing? That is an interesting situation you guys have to work out because if that debt flips into equity, then that person who has the cash will then have a big chunk of the company. Why would it ever flip into equity? Well, then, well that's a good point. That, so that's, that's what I'm talking about is uh, working with angel investors who will have your, who will issue you debt. And when bigger investors come along, that, let's say $100,000, turns into $100,000 of stock. Your kind of debt is more of the standard debt, which is, hey, you know, you can loan us money and we're gonna pay it back when the other investors come. So that's a different situation. That's a very um, generous situation, I would say, for that person to, you know, to uh, issue the debt. I would also say one thing is that make sure you give at least six percent interest, because again, the IRS. I know it's so tax driven today. Sorry, the IRS does expect the interest to be risk adjusted, so there must be something. It, are the are the Series B investors going to care about that kind of a structure? They may. Um, so they may ask the person holding the note, the note paper, to not get paid back until another later round. Because let's say let's say you're raising through a financing a you know five hundred thousand dollars. Well, then a hundred thousand dollars goes out the door. Assuming let's say you got a hundred thousand dollars debt, right? Those investors go no 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 no. This needs to fund the company. So that's why you're saying make sure the interest is reasonable, so just in case. It's, so it's kind of a at least some incentive for them to pay it back sooner rather than later. Exactly. Well, that's it. But my one is really driven from a tax perspective. Yeah. Yours is driven from more of a getting the economics right. Mm -hmm. Anyway, you were going to ask a question. But you, I thought you had your hand up. Yeah. Okay. I have a totally naive, potentially very stupid question. If if you feel like you're at a point where you just need a, a small amount of money, is there anything stopping you from? Walking into like Wells Fargo and getting a small business loan, like a like a dry cleaners would do. I mean, you could try, but it's very very hard to get those kinds of loans. You you could try a small business loan. Small business administration has a lot of loan programs. I've also heard people going to the if you've got something. Because you have nothing to secure the debt against. Is that, is that why? But they will probably ask you for a personal guarantee. Right. So you have to you know guarantee yourself, guarantee your house, or something. Like that. What if there's more than one of you? Then they'll ask one or both of you to, to sign it. So they go after both of your assets. Okay. Because don't do that. And I would agree. Because when you when you raise money from angel investors, not that they want you to lose money, but if, they, if you do lose money, it's sort of a, hey, good try. Appreciate you trying, but they don't come after you personally. The banks will come after you and get try to get back the money. Um, so the last one is what types of financing force financing forces an automatic conversion of the promissory note into preferred stock? So let me step back one sec. So like I talked about earlier, preferred stock is generally what investors use to buy in to and then the employees use common stock for sweat equity. And just to make sure we're all on the same page, I'll tell you historically, because um, I'll tell you what else happens in Korea. In Korea, everyone buys common stock. So what is happening is the investor pays a dollar, the employees get their options at a dollar. It seems like the investor is getting a good deal on that. You know, you want you want the employees to have incentive to work hard to raise the value of the company, right? Um, so historically, because Silicon Valley has always been, hey, you know, the employees create value. They said, well, how do we create a structure so that investors can pay more than than um, than the employees? So actually. Preferred stock from has a historical different type of um, function. Back in the day, on the East Coast, you find these terms of preferred stock, where it's actually more like a debt instrument. It's a way for banks and lenders to have some piece of equity, but there's a debt structure to it, and there's a dividend structure to it, which acts like interest. It's a very tax-driven thing. The VCs in the 70s saw, oh, wait a minute, there's a preferred stock thing. You actually can buy it. But if we gut it so that you can get rid of all that debt type uh, pieces to it and just hold on to the core um, pieces of uh, value of the preferred stock, which are liquidation preferences, right? Investors get paid first. Certain rights to elect board members. Um, certain rights to keep that class of stock. 
Those are important. So let's have a, a different class of stock so we can, we can value it differently. And so um, with using that historical context, I just want to let you know that because that it kind of, when you start thinking of it in terms of historical context, then it starts to make a little more sense why investors buy something different and why when you sell it to them and it converts, it should have certain rights attached to it. Because if it didn't have any rights and look exactly like common stock, then it should be common stock. It should be priced at common stock value. Um, the other way to look at it too is investors want to be protected. So much the way that banks on the East Coast were protected back in the day. Um, so generally for notes, these convertible notes, what we generally see is $2 million is your trigger in terms of if, so if I've lent the company $100,000, then if new money comes in for $2 million, then my, my debt will automatically roll into that structure. Now what happens if we don't hit the $2 million mark? It doesn't mean it doesn't, it just means that they have to negotiate with me to make that happen. And I may or may not do it. I may say, ah, you know what, I don't want to let it keep rolling. I want to see what happens. Or I say, yeah, 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 let's just flip it. Another thing that also happens is that a lot of these debt instruments have conversion caps. So let's say I said, look, you know, I, I, this is really early. You know, I feel more comfortable if my conversion cap was $5 million. And what the investor is saying is, is that if the new money of $2 million comes in and you value the company at $20 million, well, my money is valued as if it were uh, a $5 million. So they, I get a much bigger piece of the company for the money. And if you think about it, at least from the investor perspective, I think it makes sense. You may disagree. But the early investors are taking on more risk. Right? Is interest enough? Eh, I don't think so. Um, another thing is, you used to have uh, discounts. So they would say, well, you can have a 20% discount off the future valuation. Well, if I'm basically investing two years ahead of somebody, before you can raise your $2 million, does 20% sound right? It feels a little light. So there's, there's significant interest, uh, burden and interest on the investor. So if you value your early stage investors and you think they're doing you a service by helping you when you really need the money, I say, hey, a five to $10 million conversion cap is pretty reasonable. But you know, it, teach it out, right? Um, maybe I'm just acting because I say this because I'm an investor now. Oh, your shit has to different. Um, let's see, um, the next page, number six. So let's see, what happens to the convertible promissory note if maturity date is reached and there hasn't been a financing? Guess what, we have a lot of notes sitting in our portfolio right now, not, not a lot, we have a few, where it's just notes and they're over a year old. So I'll, let me tell you, um, under California law, unless you're a bank, you cannot give a note that's longer than one year. It has to be one year or less. So that means that your convertible note has to be one year out, right? That's the maximum term. Well, you can do things like extensions. That doesn't value by you. And also, essentially what you're doing is you're passing the buck. If you're past the maturity date, all it does is really put on the lender, the investor side, the burden of calling the note. Now, if they're cool and you know, you can talk to them. You can ask them what they've done historically. What do you think they do? Um, some of them will say, you know what, I'm not, I'm not worried about it. You know, it happens. You know, and let's say they could go miss the note, right? So, I'm like, damn it, I want my $100,000 back. Where's my money? Well, if you happen to sign up in a corporation, what's there? Well, your computers and the code. What's, he, what's your investor gonna do with it? Nothing. So it's not really valuable. It's better to let, let's let it ride and see what you guys can do with it. So I generally think that um, 99 times out of 100, investors won't touch you if they're not going to come after you to uh, go, go get their money back. Unless you're asking for um, Look, if they want more money, you need more money, right? And they're, you, know, you can say, look, you give them money if you, if you believe that I can actually get it more value, right? So it's actually saving your investment. I've heard that pitch a lot. Um, so next, the next one here is, what happens if the company is sold after the convertible bridge note is issued and before the maturity date or the next round of financing? 
So what happens is there's usually a clause. So we'll, we'll talk about if there's a clause and if there's no clause. If there is a clause, we see the very standard clause says, if you so get sold, then you, get, you give us the maximum of uh, the 200% of the principal. So if I put $100,000, you're going to give me $200,000 back. Or if we converted this at the conversion cap, at $5 million, if my $5 million had been converted in at $5 million, let's say you got bought for $50 million, then just convert me as if I had been converted at equity to $5 million and give me my percent for that. That doesn't seem terribly unreasonable, again, because the investor's taking risk. If there is no clause like that, then your debt, it, you're considered a creditor, or the investor's considered a creditor of the company, and they would sit on top of, um, of the company in terms of getting paid. So the buyer would simply pay out the note with any interest. The creditor, they pay all the other creditors, and then, then the rest of the money goes to the employees and founders. Um, Is that typical in a situation where there's explosive kind of revenue growth? Um, it could be, well, I guess, if you, if, you like, if you're growing really fast and you don't want to have that clause, yeah, you could say, look, we don't want that clause in there. You'll just get paid as a, as a debt holder of the company. You could do that. Um, that's just a wrinkle. Um, I would also say that it would come across to an experienced angel investor as a little bit like, oh, then I don't think I want to do this deal. I have, Why don't you go see the bank? Then it's the bank question. Yeah, go back to the bank. Yeah, we're not a bank. So you keep your hand out there. Um, all right, so then, uh, let's see. What should the terms of bridge loan warrant coverage be? So a lot of times what happens is that uh, another carrot to have is what's called warrant coverage. Essentially, it's an option to buy stock. And a lot of times, it's 10 to 20% of your note. So if I pay, if I get $100,000, right, I convert my debt into equity, and then I get to have a right to buy $10,000 worth of the Series A or Series B stock in the future. So what I'm doing is I'm basically getting another buy at the end. And that's typically a very typical term that a lot of investors like, because then you have the option of buying more stock in the company in the future. Back in the day, when companies were going public like crazy, these warrants, just got converted at the IPO. And once this wicked cashed out the IPO, you have a ton of eBay stock or something. It was a pretty good deal back in the day. Um, next one is, can you have multiple closings in a convertible note bridge financing? So what we've seen it, are that a couple situations. One, we've seen people really do multiple notes, note after note after note after note after note. But in my experience, you want to have actually one note document with one with multiple notes underneath it. And the reason for that is, if you have multiple notes, you're gonna forget how each of them work. And it's gonna get really unwieldy very fast. And while all you're doing is, when, this, when all this converts into your next round, you're paying lawyers a lot of money to figure out how this all works, how the math works. And not only do you pay for your lawyers, but the investors should have a clause where you pay for their lawyers too, you know, in your document. So you're now paying another lawyer to figure out, to check the work of your lawyer. That sucks. If you go with one note purchase agreement, what's great about that too is you only need a certain number, usually a majority of the principal, to amend terms. So you can also extend the notes. You can say, hey, as the majority, the majority of the note holders say, extend the term. We extend the term. You can have just then a fewer number of people to deal with as you're dealing with the note. Hopefully that makes sense. Question? Yeah. Oh, uh, I was thinking. Um, so, given all this, is the, the, the from the perspective of uh, uh, the venture capital side, um, how important is it to take away 50% voting control from the founders? It depends on the investor. Um, in my experience, at least the, the investors that I work with, we don't do that. So it just depends on the investor. Some investors insist, as part of the model, if you want my money, that's what I do. 
I've been planning my past doing it like this. It's like, okay. It's sort of a, you know, it's a gut check. But other investors I know don't do that. They don't take 50% control. They will take, now you say 50% of the company or 50% of voting control? Voting control. Oh, voting control, okay. So voting control is a little different because, because remember, you have classes of stock, right? They actually should be able to control their class of stock. I think that's fair, right? They bought the stock, they should control it. Um, but there will be clashes, or we should say discussions, right, about when you have a new class of stock. Well, they, are they on board or not? Well, if you're growing and the new investors coming in set a huge valuation, there should be no problem. But if it's a different down round or something, if it's a bad situation, it could be a difficult conversation. But that's what you're selling to them, too. That's part of the value you're selling to them, is that right to control a block of stock. And that's why you have to be very careful about which investors you work with, because they will, they, they could exert tremendous control. And would you, would you say as a general rule, out of curiosity, that the longer you wait to secure financing, the better position you're in, the better bargaining position you're in with regards to that? Or I would say, the longer you wait, the more product you have, the better position. So, you know, it's a really tough question. I, I look at it for more from a supply and demand. I was talking about this with Aaron a little while ago. Essentially, if you've got something that investors want, and they want it now, and there's multiple investors, I don't, it doesn't really matter what stage of product you're in. You can dictate the terms, right? If you keep waiting, and then there are no investors around, there's no market, essentially, for your company, then it's going to be very difficult to get in terms of in terms of your life. So if you got people who want to do it, I say strike while it's hot. You know, and the other rule, which we'll get to later, but I'll say it now, is that always take as much money as you can. Having more money just gives you more at bats. And the general adage of don't raise money when you need money is generally true. So the leverage completely changes if you're six weeks away from running out of money. Completely change. They can change every day until you actually have a piece of paper that's signed, and um, there's a contractual obligation on the investor to issue you money. All bets are off. It is. You can do. They can do whatever they want. I've seen. I see situations where VCs had complete partnership approval on a Monday. They expect the deal to be closed on Friday. It got pushed to Monday. The voters, the partners, re-voted and decided not to do the deal. It happens. So until the money's in the bank, it doesn't matter. Um, anyway, should we go with this? Okay. So what does subordination mean in a convertible bridge note? So just to let you guys know, um, subordination means you are the, the person issuing the money that is, is willing to say, I will let the bank and other folks get paid before I get paid. So that's generally a good thing because that investor saying, hey, if something goes wrong, you can pay your other creditors first. We'll, we'll go second. A lot of times, if you don't do that and agree to be subordinated, if you ever raise money from Silicon Valley Bank, they will make you go back to your investor and go, no, get that note amended. It needs to be subordinated to us. You need to be under us when there's some sort of cash situation. You know, banks, institutional banks don't want to lose their money, so they always make sure they're paying first. Um, and then number 11 is, what is a security interest in connection with a convertible note? You know, I don't know if this, there's a typical answer to this one. Uh, some investors say, hey, you know what, I'm not going to give you money. I want your IP to be my security for this. I generally don't see that in early stage. That, that sort of term is usually more appropriate for a post-Series A type company where you have lots of employees and you've got IP. Something like patents or something, and I usually see that uh, term more with um, more institutional type investors. So I don't see it that much. All right, next page. Um, Series A financing. What is the dividend preference? Look, I, I don't want to go through all these. I'll just tell you what I think is important. But each of these questions, if you get a sort of a super careful attorney, or you get someone who is new at their job as an attorney, 
They're going to ask you, what do you want to do about all this? Like, what the hell are you talking about? I don't know this stuff. You know this stuff, right? Let me just tell you what's important. And again, any 20 rule, right? Just to get rid of, reduce legal fees and so you guys can focus on your business. Don't worry about liquidation preference. There is, don't, don't even let your lawyer give one. Um, that means that the investors get a, basically for every year that you don't um, basically buy them out, they have an accumulating six to eight percent interest. It's called a dividend that kind of sits on top. It's a bad term. You see that on the East Coast, and you don't see that on the West Coast, this term. Um, liquidation preference, this is the one to focus on. So it's basically saying for equity, for your Series A stock or Series B, how do you pay the investor? So preference is who gets preferred first. So if let's say a million dollars went in as Series A, that means at least they're going to get a million dollars back. That's a preference. So they get paid a million dollars before anyone else gets paid. Now there's several options to this, and there's probably hundreds of different variations, but let me give you sort of the basic one. There's what's called particip participating preferred and non-participating preferred. What's participating preferred, it means that if the million dollars is equivalent to 10% of the company, they get the million dollars, and then the remaining money is divided as if those uh, preferred stock was equal to 10%. So they get whatever, 10% of the remaining money. So, if it's, so to keep the math easy, if it's a $1 million investment, you sell a company for $101 million, they get the first million, and you divide the other 100 million, of which they get 10%, so they get 11 million off their investment of, 10, of 1 million. And then everybody else gets the 90. The non participating preferred is, now think about this, Remember, I own 10% of the company. Well, I can make a choice. Do I want to get my million dollars off the top, or I'd rather take my 10, 10 million? Well, clearly, I'd rather take my 10 million, right? So you would get converted as if you owned 10%. And usually, there's a clause that automatically gives the election to the investor of the most maximum economic value. Um, you know, the question is, why would, why would you as a company give up participating preferred? Uh, it's, it's shifting. It's typically Sequoia. They don't do participating. They just go, you know what? We're like you guys. We're like the founders. We're just going to just do whatever you do. And we're going to do non participating preferred. Um, generally, I would say from our firm's perspective, we like participating preferred because we feel like we're not Sequoia. You know, they, can, they can do, they have a lot of market power. Um, we feel like we do a lot of riskier deals. And we, that has to actually, that clause has saved our butts a few times. So, um, if you don't like that term, then don't come to us, I guess, is the answer. So, so you'd be worried that um, you know, the, the original investors, the founders, would be willing to sell for maybe a lower amount um, than, than you would like, and you know, the, the participating preferred investor would like to capture, at least capture their initial investment um, first, because they don't want to be, they're not a bank giving industry loan, they want to. Right. Yeah. There's a there's a real risk, right? That if I put in a million dollars, there's some number where they sell for some number, and then I don't get my million dollars back. So why not just just take care of that with the pre money valuation? Why not just you know? Yep. That, there's there's definitely an argument for that, and that's that's how it's a negotiation. Yeah. So yeah, you're absolutely so, right. You so, can, so so they'll you know different different firms will approach that differently. Is what you're saying. Exactly. Exactly. It, it comes down to, and I'll get to it later, but it gets down, comes down to knowing the person you're working with on the other side. Um, I would say, just I'll just tell you what it is. Anti-dilution protection is if I bought stock at a dollar, right? And this isn't applied to stock options and things like that. But then you would go out and issue to another investor stock, any kind of stock, for let's say a penny, then I'm getting kind of screwed. So I'm going to say, well, I want to make sure that my stock price is adjusted so that it reflects something between a dollar and a penny. It's not going to be a penny. It could be a penny, but generally you don't see those documents. It's something in between. We call it narrow ratchet versus full ratchet. So don't worry about that. Um, information rights are really the right of the investors to receive you know, financial information, board packages, things like that. And remember, investors need this because they have limited partners. 
usually, and they need to give information back to their investors. So it's just a helpful way to keep the information flow going. It's not because they want to get you grilled and question you on every little penny you spend. Registration rights, this is, uh, it's called this a good problem to have, and generally it just means that when you go do an IPO, usually the company sells stock to the public markets. It's, this is, hey, does, do I as an investor have the right to combine some of my stock with your stock that you're selling so you can sell some of my stock at the offering? But um, I would not spend any time on this. Just to tell, them you're, tell your lawyer, just do whatever standard. Because, it's the, you know, no one argues over this stuff. Uh, it's the next page. Uh, what's the market standout for IPO lockup provision? Usually what this says is for six months, no one means investors, unless, you're, unless you have registration rights, um, employees, no one sells for six months after the IPO. And the reason is, is you don't want, again, supply and demand, right? You don't want a flood of shares coming out of the market because it'll disrupt the supply and demand balance. You want to, the company ideally would like to control that flow. And um, a lot of companies do a good job of that because if you, again, if you, if you, everyone starts dumping on the market, then shares generally drop pretty quickly in price. So a lot of IPOs, um, this is probably a little too much information, they have something called the option overhang. So they look and see six months out how many people have vested stock and can just dump their shares in the market. It's, it can get pretty scary. So when, when did Zika go public? Do you guys remember? Anyone remember? When they went public, what, what was it? November. All right, so May. Let's find out how people are dumping their stock. Are they already doing it? Oh, not sure how. That's good. They made it some, it was in the news recently, they made some change where they somehow let people do it in a way that managed that flow, like you were saying. Oh, interesting. <coughs> Interesting, interesting. I can, I can figure out what they're doing so we can avoid doing that. <laughs> um, right of first offer, or the right to maintain proportionate ownership in future financing. That means that if, if I own 100% of your Series A stock, that means if I have this right, I get to buy 100% of your Series B stock. Generally, it doesn't work that way. Because if the valuation is going up, um, A, you probably want, and so do I as an investor, I probably want someone else to value this company so that we know what the, what the market values of this stuff. Um, the other thing is that you want to, as a, as a company gets bigger, you probably want other investors to help with filling in certain gaps in your company, right? Are you, do you need stronger help with marketing? Do you need stronger help with customers? Or do you need just more deeper pockets around the table. You know, there's always different reasons. You can just think of this again in terms of negotiating. This just means that your current investor then will have just the ability to say, you know what, I actually want to keep 70% of the next round, so let's bring in somebody who is willing to take 30% of the round, that kind of thing. So it's a negotiation issue. But it is a real issue. Some, like Sequoia, they're very, very strict on this. They will not cut anyone in into their deals. So, um, the good news is, if you're riding high and you're doing really well, they will keep pumping money into your company. The bad news is, if, um, don't tell them I said this, but if you're not doing so well, um, they, it may be tougher to get money out of them. And they may die with a pro athlete. So, not that I've really seen that happen, but the threat has always been out there, from my understanding. I don't have any direct knowledge of that, but that's sort of the, it's not a ticket supply, just everyone on camera. Um, it, this is just a, be careful, it's a, more of a tailor, be careful who you give this to, but everyone's going to ask for it. And it's a, I think it's a pretty standard thing not to argue over. Um, what is the right first refusal and co-sale agreement? So what this means is that um, if a founder wants to sell stock, right, then let's say Joe wants to sell 100 shares of stock to, um, to, to an investor then what it could mean is either A, hey, Joe, you gotta offer me that stock first. I'd be willing to buy it, because you're gonna get, under the terms of the contract, you're gonna have the number of shares and the price per share in your agreement. I get the right to match that and buy it. Or, if the offer is so damn good, guess what? I get to co-sell with you. So if you have 
You can sell 100 shares, you can sell 50 years, 50 of mine, because that deal is too good to pass up. So that's, that's what this gentleman means. Um, a drag along or bring along provision. This is where being a California incorporated company versus a Delaware corporate company makes a difference. Um, I would still recommend Delaware, although maybe you know, I'm an investor, so you guys will do differently. But in Delaware, these uh, sort of drag along rights, which means if the board or if the investors agree to sell the company, or a certain percentage of the common stock agrees to sell the company, then everyone agrees to sell the company. In Delaware, that provision is enforceable. Under California, you would actually need separate classes of stock to, to actually get that done. And that means, guess what? The founders and employee, employees control, share the control of the destiny of the company. But that's why, um, because of this provision, you see a lot more companies incorporated in Delaware because investors say, hey look, the rules are more favorable to us, you know, and we want to control um, the sale, the sale of the company. Now, remember, controlling sale of the company though isn't, it's, it's not intended to be this really bad thing, right? What it's intended to be is, it's, it allows for a quicker sale of the company. So if you're interested in making sure that your buyer doesn't walk away, you want this. You want to be able to do it quickly. You don't want something slowing you down. Because buyers will walk away. Day to day, it can happen. But I think actually the more, thing, more important thing to understand is that any good buyer, and you probably want to be sold to a good buyer, they're going to take care of their employees. They're going to take care of you and your employees. So don't worry about this provision. Because it, it ultimately, the buyer knows the value is the people. So they will generally give you know, retention agreements, maybe even a uh, signing bonus, things like that. So I, I would say this leads to problems, but it does cause a lot of founders to have heartburn because like, it's like a drag along provision. You're dragging me along with this. I don't want to do it, right? But really, it's not a bad thing. What's the percentage? Um, usually, it's if it's the majority of the preferred stock say yes, then. And then, yeah, about 51% of the con. But sometimes, I mean, it's, I forget what the, there's really no, I guess there is a standard, I don't remember what it was, but um, it's J, I think 50%. But it's definitely, if it's, sometimes if it's the board, if the board agrees unanimously to sell the company, and usually the founders have at least two seats, right? Then, like two out of five, or three out of five, and if it's unanimous, then everyone, everyone on the board has to agree to, to vote this thing. And that will trigger the drag on for everybody else as well. Okay, we're in the final stretch, the VC perspective. Um, like, you, probably, you guys already know this, this is the progression usually that we see of people getting funded. It's friends and family, it's generally small checks, ten to $50,000 raise. Um, then you got your angels, just super angels, between, let's call it 25,000, maybe 250,000. You have early stage, VC, early stage VCs. We invest in check size between 200K and 5 million. So the early stage VCs are probably like you know, 50,000 to 500,000. And then you have your, your VCs. And just to give you state of the market, these days we're hearing that a lot of VCs who thought they were early stage realize they don't like the early stage anymore. They're, they're progressing back to their standard, you know, standard $2 million Series A type valuations because they realize that the return on their time is not there. So they realize that, gee, these companies, when we invest in a lot of them, they, re they require a lot of time to, to help. So they realize they're, they got to focus more. So the pendulum swung back a little bit. Um, next one, the VC perspective. So this is really just my sort of shorthand for this. And I, I want to walk you through uh, sort of the way I see the world. So don't take this as all VCs. But it, it, you know, it kind of makes sense, just think about it, right? So if you want to raise money, it's a pretty low percentage of success to walk into an investor, you know, again, we do early stage from 200,000 on up, and say, I got this great idea. Okay, um, great, but what kind of idea is who are you, right? You're gonna need a lot more than just the idea to convince us to go to my partnership, because I'm a partner, and I have one partner, and we gotta talk and to convince both of us to, to fund an idea. We've basically funded, out of our 16 deals, one idea. But 
the founder was a rock star, and he had already shown success in another company. I was like, okay, we'll take a fly on this one. And so far, so good. Um, but it's a really low percentage. I mean, if, if you think like, we might fund one out of every 150 companies we see, if it was just an idea, it'd be probably one in 500, or one in 1,000. Um, you have a medium percentage of success, I think, if you have an idea and a demo. You say, hey, look, it works. Look what's going on. I spent all this time and effort, and here's how it works, and here's what's going on. And hopefully, if you understand your target investor, they'll get it too. And if they get it too, they may go, oh my god, this is better than baseball. We're doing this, right? Um, but again, I, don't, I, I would say it's a tough sell. The, the third point is tied with the rest of it, which is if you actually do a soft launch and you're showing good metrics and say, look, I know how to measure my business, I know what I'm doing, for every dollar I put in, I get $1.50 out. This is how, and like, you don't know where it's gonna be, but I can tell you where I've been. And here are all the mistakes I've learned. And here's all the things I know. And here's where, here the, here's where I'm headed, and here's what I'm not gonna do. Because what you're not doing also focuses you and focuses the investor. And they go, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You have a much better chance of success. And it's also tied to um, the second and third thought here. They should probably, I should probably flip them, but I'll just go in order. So, if you were sitting in our shoes, and you had $100 to invest in, I think you'd all agree, you'd prefer company number three, right? You would prefer the company who been there, done that, know what they're doing, has a team, and execute. You, I don't think if we were, some, you know, if we were reverse, you would do anything different, because why would you? You have a fiduciary duty to your investors to maximize your return. So you should be careful. How do you? How are you careful? Then you should, you know, find companies who, who look like they're growing. Um, so what I want you guys to take away from this is control your destiny, right? The third thing: do try to do what you can to launch. Try to do what you can to have metrics. Understand your business. It doesn't mean you have to have millions of users. But you should have users. You should have people who are outside of your friends and family using this stuff. Wait, first you and then you. Yeah. Well, question on uh, kind of a unique situation because we have many investors uh, coming in from uh, Europe, <coughs> stuff, like America, and Asia. We're trying to figure out the right process because they're the ones that invest in startups and so on. And we'd like to you know if you have any sort of process or any sort of uh, ID flows that you would suggest that we could uh, look at skills. Um, what do you mean, IB flows? Uh, the investment bank, of course. Oh, you know, you mean like how to raise money, that kind of thing? No, no, well, we have the money coming in, but we're trying to figure out how to fund the best, how to pre-qualify for, for startups, because in the past we dealt with larger companies, not small startups. Oh, I see. So you're, you're investing. <coughs> yeah. You're investing, and you want to know how to find the right... Right, we have a group of investors coming to the work for us, and channeling that into the right places. So... My, uh, again, it, it, this is going to be supply and demand again, right? So there is a supply of companies. You need to look at as many as you can. You will find the outliers. That's what I say. Find the outliers. Find the people who are number three, who, who know, sort of, you can see they're doing something. They'll, they'll pop out. It becomes pretty obvious after a while. Like, oh, that must, again, you need people who have done it a lot. And have a lot of reps, which is why Sequoia, I believe, is the, one of the best VCs out there because they see everything. And so because they see everything, they can see who's an outlier. And that's, that's, that's the key. There's no magic, I think there's no magic formula. I think. Would you say that we go through so many fiscal quarters, divide the companies over so many fiscal quarters, or? No, sometimes, I mean, sometimes we make a decision in a week. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a matter of, you're in the door, we're looking at you, and look, again, supply and demand. If there's a company, and there are four churches on the table, we'll be like, all right, make a couple phone calls, yep, those investors are in. Uh, all right, I guess we should be more aggressive about this. That will change the time significantly. So we don't sit around, we, we, try, we try to make our decisions within two weeks. Yeah. You had a question? Just, just out of curiosity, out of all the companies that have come across your desk recently, how, what percentage of them fall in the category three? Like they really have to act together demonstrably 
number three type companies? Is it most of them? Do they wait until they're at that stage generally before they go to you, or do you get all kinds? We get all kinds, um, and we see more like number twos. If the, you know, we get more of the bulk of number twos, and then second category would be number threes, and then we don't see a lot of number ones, although we do see some number ones. Uh, but jumping number two is what we see more. So can I, uh, when you say idea plus demo, does that usually mean, uh, I mean there's some blend between uh, two and three, right? You know, um, the demo is in, you know, they've done, that they have like, you know, a Ruby on Rails thing running and that it's, you know, it's, it's mock-ups and stuff or are we talking like, you know, it's clear that they've done work but not, not an actual product being used to an consumer or is it uh, like a closed beta thing? But, or is it like a, uh, a, a product that is just only launched in San Francisco kind of thing? It could be any of those, I think. I mean, it could so be... That's a pretty broad category. It's a broad category. Yeah, it's a broad category. The number three is more like, we've got, ironically, I'll give you this example, which is why there's no hard rules here, right? But a guy came in and said, hey, I've got number two. Okay, what are you, what's interesting for number three? I said, 100,000 users. He's like, okay. Comes back and says, I have 400,000 users. Is it interesting? I'm like, uh, what, what are we showing? Should we always mention something? Uh, I don't know. What about more? Comes back later, it's half a million users. How about that? I'm like, uh, I don't know. I mean, so it still may not be enough. So it's really about demonstrating something interesting. You know, I, and I know it's not easy to define, but you so have to be interest, commitment, and then validation. Interest or, or, or uh, the interesting idea is number one, the commitments number two, and then the, the actual resonation with end users should be number three. Resonate, yeah. And resonate you would say users. that the company, the people like us, would get better deals the further down that list we go. Yes, and the more differentiated you can be. Like, no one wants to see another Pinterest. Right? Sure. So that's like done. That's, it's been done. Do it. What have we been working on the last night? I know, I'm sorry guys. But you can, sh you can always uh, you know, shift. But um, essentially, what, uh, what you guys should be doing is, I think, is just trying to iterate and shift and trying to find something that has explosive growth. Because without that growth, think about it, you don't want to be doing this either. We've seen plenty of situations where people raise a little bit of money and they're just struggling, and they just wasted three years of their lives. Now, is, that, is it a waste because they've learned a lot about themselves, learned about the community, they've become experts, that's great, but you're gonna start to feel a burden from your investors. Not because they're calling you, but because you feel like a moral obligation to them. You're gonna feel like, ah, oh, geez, guys, like, I'm really sorry. In fact, before I came here, I just met one of our, our companies that we lent some money to through, no, we never called it, good guys, but they're not going anywhere. But we still meet up because I'm like, how can I help you? What can I do for you? And they felt like, hey, no, we're not sure if it's going to go anywhere. We might shut this down. I'm like, do what you think is best for you. We're, we're cool with whatever you do. We're not going to come after you, so don't worry about it. Yeah. One last question, I swear. Uh, uh, so, like, you know, one thing I've noticed is that with a lot of this, you know, you mentioned users and metrics and stuff. And I, I think it's interesting to me that, um, that like, you look at, um, you know, some of the, uh, yeah, of course, some of the, you know, you can, you'll make the obvious comparisons to the Facebooks and the growth of people like Twitter and whatnot, but, or Pinterest. But, you know, what about how much of the VC market has gotten wrapped up in that and the social and the, the low value per user but just tons of eyeballs versus, say, I mean, you know, like the very underserved pro market on, on you know, mobile, but like, uh, uh, I, I, I'm not saying that's particularly what we're working on, but I, this has always been an interest to me, you know, because I noticed that more established companies like Adobe and Omni have been getting into that kind of a business, and they're some of the highest revenue earners on the app store right now, and they sell to a very niche market, but they're selling $50 apps, and they're seeing a really, really good success with that. I mean, just frankly speaking, is that is that something that is, is it, it's clear that there's money there, but is that just something that is of not of interest that we want to, that we want the, if it doesn't have the social viral buzzword, it's not going to be interesting to VCs right now? I actually think there are investors for every category out there. It's a matter of finding them. Imagine. Magic is hard. 
That's why you have to go and just meet people and say, do you know someone who'd be interested in this? Go ahead. So, uh, seriously, my partner, he has very different interests than I do. Mm -hmm. And when, the way we work is that I have to convince him to do deals that I like, he has to convince me to do the deals that he likes. And you know what? If, if someone happens to do a coin flip and they go, I'd rather go talk to him first, he may say, I'm not interested in this and walk away. It'll never get to me, even if I was interested in it. So not, we might, he might mention to me in passing or something, but I actually think you need to target the individual investor and, and fi try to understand what they like and try to get a sense would they be open-minded to um, the opportunity. So it, it, I, think, I do think there are investors out there. So. Uh, it's just, well, and I think the thought is to us, it's like, you know, one of the, one of the brand new aspects of this is that we're being told, uh, you know, a lot of us are faced with the challenge of, you know, create something revolutionary that's gonna appeal to the greatest amount of people as possible, great. But also build it in such a way that there's going to be barriers to entry, so some kid in the garage can't just duplicate it and steal the idea and do whatever in like a week. So you know, it, it, it says more for serving the you know the and the enterprise niche and the, some of these more niche markets are both easier to serve, require a lot more technical investment, and also require the kind of people and expertise that you know are seldom have. So I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm just got, I guess I'm trying to gauge from the other side of the fence is there. Is there still interest in this kind of thing, or is pretty much everybody? Is it all like social, mobile, 100 million users to get them now? That's what we want to hear. Nope, I think there are plenty of investors who'd be very interested in enterprise ideas. That is not our. I was saying, yeah, enterprise. But I, every individual, non-mobile, non-social, there are people still out there. Yeah, I mean, if it's a game, I, I want to see a decent DAU, like you know, you know, revenue. So if it's maybe if it's north of uh, ten cents, I'd be love to look at it, right? If it's less than three cents, I probably would be less interested. But if it was three that could go to twenty, then yeah, you know. So for games, to me, it's like, did you figure out the revenue metrics yet? You know, um, some people say I don't want to talk to any game company until they've hit. You know, a million users. We're not like that. We'll, we'll look at anybody that's showing something. And look, don't forget, like, there's some people like us, you know, we, we generally will say, look, we're happy to get a really look. It might be multiple quarters before we get there, but, you know, check in with us. We'll take a look and we'll just talk and we'll figure it out over time. You know? But there's, but you're right, there are a ton of metrics. And it's, I think, um, always start with the strongest metric first. So if it's, hey, we're getting, 100,000 100, new users a day through just organic, non paid acquisition. Uh, that's, that's interesting. Like, how's that happening? Right? But if you're starting with, we don't monetize, that's not a good metric, right? So start with your strongest metric first, is what I say. Should we hit the last page? So, this is my, uh, you know, sort of advice is I know I said don't be a lawyer, but if you do get a lawyer, Make sure you use one that has the startup program. They generally ask for, uh, they give you about 1%, they exchange 1% of, of your common stock. Uh, they'll give you about $20,000 of free legal work. Use it wisely. Usually the legal work is for corporate stuff only, like a corporation, um, your basic founder documents, your assignment of inventions in exchange for the stock. Um, and it's not for like licensing. It's not for tax work. It's not for immigration work. Generally, that stuff is paid. And it's also not for filing fees. So there, there will be out of pocket expenses. But these kinds of programs will at least get you on the right path. And at least you'll be able to um, know that you have a basic framework that is fundable at that point. Um, you could go with LegalZoom and all these other kind of things, but you're just kind of kind of walk into a blind situation. I, I kind of don't recommend those, but you know, there's nothing wrong with them if you know what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, I guess basically it's advertising and Pillsbury is probably a very good firm. Um, is it just medical, medical? Okay. They, they, do, they do everything. Um, but 
they have not been historically a early stage, you know, you know, sort of small company type, uh, you know, supporting the small type of uh, firm, and their rates can start to go up very, very fast. But they may have a program, a similar one. The guy I knew that was there, I think he left, so I don't know where he went. But uh, but look, they're a good firm, so I, I wouldn't. I would not go there. I would definitely talk to multiple lawyers. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, I hope you guys found it helpful. I appreciate all the questions.